Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Turn to the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus. And once you find chapter 1, if you would stand with me, please. Leviticus chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 1 through 4. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. And the Lord called unto Moses, and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. And if his offering be burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon his head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much that you've given us your word. And Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom and guidance and strength to be able to follow the commandments that you've placed upon us. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that you would speak to us today from uh, this passage, that you would uh, deal with issues of the heart, and that you would be glorified through everything that's done and said. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Wonderful to have everyone here today. Um, we have a, a group listening. And we're so glad that you've tuned in and are with it. Those are in the back in the overflow. Just great to be with you today. So today, we're going to sort of go to the classroom. And my message today is basically all introduction um, to where I think the Lord will have us go on the oncoming months. And as I go through the introduction, you'll explain, you understand just a, a little bit. I want to preach to us today on discovering Christ in the Old Testament. Um, if you have been married for any length of time, you know that there are two points of view, right? Men, it's your view, and then it's the right view. <clears throat> uh, in the marriage. Um, no, what you're going to find, I think you would all agree, is this. The husband has his view, and he'll express that. The wife has her view, and she'll express that, and express that, and <laughs> I'm kidding. But what happens is, when you take both of those views and you put them together, you actually have a third view. Make sense? The man's view, without the wife speaking on a subject, is thus and thus. The wife's view, without the husband speaking, would be thus and thus. But when they come together, those views interact and actually you, and it is a strengthened view. Okay? When we go to the scripture, you're going to find the same thing. And I hope to illustrate that for you uh, this morning. Um, I hope that the message will be helpful to you um, in understanding um, the person of Christ a little bit better. So let's start here. We're actually going to start in the New Testament and move back to the Old Testament. New Testament and move back to the Old Testament. So let's go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. And verse number 11. Notice what it says here, 1 Corinthians 10 11. Now all these things happened. And it's speaking of verses 1 to 10 about things that have happened in the Old Testament. Okay? Now all of these happened unto them in the Old Testament for and samples or examples. 
To who? Well, us in the New Testament. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth are come. What he's saying here is the Old Testament, it has examples and it has admonitions for us. If I can put it um, this way, he says right here, now these things are written, that word written is to write or mean engraved. These things are engraved for our encouragement, for our learning, for our instruction. Uh, these things have happened. They have fallen out to be examples for us. So there are examples and admonitions for us where? In the Old Testament. Notice again, if you would, in 2 Corinthians 3. We remember this passage about Moses and the veil over his face. He saw the very, uh, he was up and God was speaking to him. He was in the presence of God. He came down and his face shone. He had a veil over his face. And uh, Paul picks that up and makes an illustration with it, 2 Corinthians 3 um, and uh, let's go to verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil was done away in Christ. He picks that up and says, until they understand the New Testament, there's a veil. They don't understand Christ. And then he says, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veils upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. What's he saying right here for us in the New Testament? You can't understand Christ in his fullness without the help of the Old Testament. Now wait a minute, I see some of you saying, okay, that's the first time I've heard him say something. That just can't be right. It is right, and I will try to explain. A second Timothy, let's go there, chapter 3. Second Timothy 3. We know verse 16 so well. We can quote it. But often we are passing over verse 15. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 3 and 15, Paul speaking to Timothy, and from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Which Holy Scriptures? He's talking about the Old Testament here. You've known them from a child, Timothy which are able to make the wise unto what? Salvation. Salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He's saying, do you understand that the Old Testament helps in matters of salvation? In the early church, the view of the Old Testament enlightened them to understand the work of Christ. That's pretty powerful. Let's go to one more before we go to Leviticus, and that's Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter number 4. Romans 4, he's talking about justification by faith, and he's going to teach us about that. Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, Jew and Gentile are all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And by the way, if you're here today and you've never been saved, you need to embrace that truth. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner that needs a Savior. You're not a sinner that needs a church. You're a sinner that needs a Savior before you need a local church. Notice this, what it says um, in Romans chapter number 14, and I go to verse number 16, therefore it is of faith, 
that it might be, Romans 4, 16, by grace, to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only that which is of the law, but that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who was the father of us all, a spiritual father, if you would, down to verse 20. What about Abraham? He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham, being uh, and being fully persuaded that he which had promised, he was able to perform it. Abraham was fully persuaded, persuaded that that which God promised he was able to do. And therefore it was imputed to him who Abraham, Abraham for righteousness. Then we go to verse uh, 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, what is your point? My whole point here is the whole application of faith is he's using the historical fact of justification for, from the life of Abraham. So let's now turn back to Leviticus 1. <clears throat> Let me try to illustrate this now this way. I, I, I said to you that if you have the husband's view, you have one point of view. The wife's view, you have two points of view. When you bring them together, you're going to, to mold and melt into something new, and you have a third point of view. When you go to the Old Testament, can I put it this way? In the Old Testament, you have the view from the viewpoint of a biblical shadow, the Bible calls it. Okay? The Old Testament is the view of a biblical shadow. But when I move to the New Testament, what do I have? I have further spiritual enlightenment. Does that make sense? Okay, in the Old Testament, we have the basis for all that God has done. You don't want to miss this now. Okay, and, and it is a biblical shadow. When I go to the New Testament, I have more spiritual enlightenment. But when I look from the New Testament to the Old Testament, with the light I have in the New Testament, I have a third view, and there's more light concerning the person of Jesus Christ when you blend the New Testament with the Old Testament. Amen. We have just seen it in the Scripture here. I've given you three or four specific examples. Husband, one view. Wife, second view. Together, a greater view. New Testament... There, there's nothing neglected when it comes to our salvation, of course not. But what I'm saying to you is that is one view, particularly of the person of Christ. The Old Testament's another view, but when you take the light of the New Testament that you know, and you go where we're going, like to the book of Leviticus, what happens is that Old Testament now begins to bloom like flowers in summer. We get a brand new picture and grasp of that. So what I want to encourage you, number one, is very often we're going to hesitate reading the Old Testament. Can I say to you that if you go to the Old Testament, and as Mrs. Jesse Boyd once said, every time I put my plow down in the Old Testament, I dig up Jesus Christ. And if you'll go with that view, okay, it will really enhance, I believe, your study of the Bible and your understanding of Christ. So, I am saying to you, with all that we know about Jesus Christ, even as a believer here, when you go to the Old Testament, I believe that your understanding of the person of Christ, of the gospel itself, can be enlarged. It can be enriched by the viewpoint of the Old Testament narratives. Um, it was the Chicago Statement on Biblical Hermeneutics that said, we affirm that the person and work of Jesus Christ are the central focus of the Bible. 
if we look at the Bible, wouldn't you agree as we look at this book that that red line of redemption that runs from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus Christ? Therefore, there are some things that enrich our view of the person of Christ. I enjoy, many of you know this, I enjoy a garden. I do it, I need to do it, I enjoy doing it. Um, but, guess what I've learned? There's a whole lot I can learn on YouTube videos about gardening. How about you? Huh? Yeah, there's a lot you can learn. It, it, it really is. Um, so let's go back, if you would, to the Old Testament, to the book of Leviticus, and again, a lot of introduction here for you today. Okay? When I come to the book of Leviticus, I'm sure all of you just went inside today and you went, oh yeah, Leviticus! I don't think so. Okay? I mean, you're saying this is not like Genesis, it's not like the Psalms, it's not like the Gospels, it's not like the New Testament. I mean, this is Leviticus. Okay? Uh, and do you, what's so interesting about Leviticus is they just, the Spirit of God wrote it, but He tore the introduction off. Oh, yeah, you see exactly what I mean. You know, you're dealing with. New Testament books of introduction, right? Well, here is how Leviticus starts. And the Lord called Moses and spake unto him, I the tabernacle of the congregation, and said, Speak unto the children of Israel. That's it. I mean, that is it until you understand that the introduction to Leviticus is the last chapter of Exodus. And literally, you could put them together in the book simply, or a continuation of what just happened. In Exodus. Okay, well, what just happened in Exodus? Well, we finally have the tabernacle finished, don't we? We have some instruction given. After that instruction is given, um, it tells us in verse 31 And Moses and Aaron and his sons washed uh, their hands and uh, their feet thereof, when they went into the tent of the congregation. They reared it up, verse 33. Verse 34, a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. Verse 35, Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation. Now, oh, by the way, I'm not going to make a distinction between the tent of the congregation and the tabernacle. I'm putting that together as the same entity, okay? Because of the cloud thereon. Verse 36, when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward. But if the cloud was not taken up, when they journeyed not until the day of it was taken up. For verse 38, for if the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and fire by night, in the sight of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. When we go to now Leviticus 1, the background is this, that they are sitting in front of Mount Sinai. And through the whole writing of the book of Leviticus, and probably the first ten, ten chapters of Numbers, they are standstill sitting there in Leviticus in, in front of Sinai, and probably 50 days God gives Moses, the writer of this book, all of this information. All right. What's interesting here as we do this, we go to a book that is full of offerings and feasts. A book that is full of sacrifices, ceremony, instructions, rituals, washings, holy day, observances, warnings, and a bunch of what we would consider little, just little we might almost think biblical insignificant, but they aren't issues. We have leprosy dealt with here. We have mothers dealt with here. But the great theme of this book is the holiness of God. Amen. We have five books in the Pentateuch, the first part of the Bible. And it's interesting, the center book is Leviticus. 
We have all the histories, the laws, but the center of it, if you would, is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sacrifice for us, and we're going to see that again and again if we take time here in this particular book. Genesis, we have the Creator, the Covenant God, and Exodus, we have the Redeemer, but here in Leviticus, we have the Holy One. It sets forth the work of God through sacrifice. And if I could, if I could now, I, I want to begin, and the first verse is sort of a heavy verse. And I, I just want you to get this as, as an introduction, not only to the Old Testament and the person of Christ, but here's a, a little introduction as we carry over from Leviticus, from Exodus into Leviticus. And I want you to see this. God gives instructions on preparing Israel for sacrifice. Now notice it. And the Lord called unto Moses. What makes that really significant is in the Hebrew, the first part of that verse is, and God called. And it actually carries with it the idea of God reaching out in his call. And he's going to call to Moses. And he's actually going to call to the priesthood. He's going to call with instruction. God is reaching out. And when you see where he's reaching out from, it becomes really interesting. If you would, the, the, the sister to this in the New Testament is what? That the church, what is the church? It's a called out people from the world unto God. This church, if you know Christ as Savior, and I'm not talking about the physical church here, but if you are part of the body of Christ, you were called out from the world unto Jesus Christ, gifted by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. This is the idea here. God is calling out. He's, he's reaching out. And what helps us with this, when we look at this, is we understand that Moses himself, number one, is a type of the person of Christ. He becomes God's spokesman. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him. This is the one I want to speak to. This is the one that I want to use. Don't you love... Uh, the way God does that, it's always organized. God gives Moses truth and says, you're responsible to instruct. Well, it's like that the whole way through the Bible, right? God comes to the home, and he says to the dad and then to the mom, by the way, fathers, you're responsible for the spiritual instruction of your wife, to make sure she is at the place that she should be. She's under your spiritual guidance. Both of you together are responsible for instruction of the children. He, he comes to me. He calls a pastor and says, okay, overall, number one, you're responsible here for instruction. Then he calls up other leaders, doesn't he? And you're responsible for what? Instruction and help and leadership. God does that again and again. Can I stop and ask you, are you saying no to God's call in areas of leadership? Would God want you to step up and be involved somewhere? Has the Spirit of God been saying, hey, 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 I could use you here, I could use you here. Now some of you are bowing your heads, don't do that, I'm not ready to pray. Okay? No, 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 let's let God Let's let God call us. Maybe you're here and you're not sure about your salvation. And the Lord's saying, hey, hey, let's get this settled. Let's get this taken care of. There's a call that's come ringing over the restless waves, send the light, send the light by Charles Gabriel. There's a call that the Lord gives to each one of us. There's a call to fellowship. And that's the call that we have here. But what sets this apart, and we could miss it so very easily, is notice verse 1 again. And the Lord God called Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, this is a first. This has not happened before. Oh, God has 
God has spoken to people in the Old Testament, and He's given them instruction. We'll see places like that, but never out of the tabernacle. See, God spoke to Moses on the mount, gave him the law, thundering from the mount, but not here. The reason, oh, and God speaks in visions, and God speaks in dreams. He's done that because the Bible wasn't finished at that point. Now the Word of God is finished. But God speaks here, not simply out of the air, not from the clouds, not in the vision, not in the dream, not from the mountaintop. He speaks from the Ark of the Covenant, I believe the mercy seat. He speaks from the tabernacle. At this point, I believe that the glory of God had fallen upon the tabernacle. No one else was in there. And God begins to speak, and He gives the book of Leviticus to Moses, a book about His holiness, a book about worship, a book that is a shadow form in all of the rituals and specifics, but all of it, as you look back, begins to speak of the gospel of Christ or the person of Christ or our response to the God of holiness. He speaks here from the tabernacle. I mean, he spoke to, to Moses, do you remember that, out of the burning bush? giving the Ten Commandments, all that happening here. But God begins to share. When I go to 1 John, in fact, why don't we go there so you can tie these two together. Stay in Leviticus, I'm sorry, let's go to John, not 1 John, John. John 1. <clears throat> John 1. The Lord God here uh, he's speaking out of the tabernacle. The Lord is. And you're going to find, now follow this truth. Get the first to John and look up this way because I don't want you to miss this. God's speaking is progressive. It's progressive in the sense that he is refining it and he finally comes to the place where the tabernacle just being finished the glory of God falling upon it. It's the place where all of Israel would come on the Day of Atonement, right? And they would go into the mercy seat and blood would be offered up that the nation could be taken care of and their sins forgiven. It's the front of the tabernacle where all the sacrifices would come to. It is that place of pureness of holiness, where the glory of God is, where the very presence of God is, that He's speaking. Well, we know what happens, even with all of this happening, Israel finally turns their back on God, disobeys God. God has to break the nation up. We have 400 silent years. We go to the New Testament, and now the Lord again, to reach out to mankind, sends what? His Son. And notice, if you would, in John, and um, let's go there uh, to verse 13, verse 14, John 14. And the Word, speaking of Jesus Christ here, was made flesh and dwelt. Do you know what that word dwelt is? It's the word tabernacled. And he was, and he dwelt, he was tabernacled among us. And we beheld, just like the Old Testament tabernacle, His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. <clears throat> now, now, go with me. you got to stay with me. We're in classroom time right now. Okay? God cannot speak from the tabernacle until the tabernacle was finished. Right? But when the tabernacle was finished his, and his presence is there, that's where he's speaking from. There could be no message until the tabernacle was finished. Okay? There is no message about the cross until the cross is finished. It is when Jesus died and rose again that we now have a message. All right? 
And just like the Lord spoke to Moses, here are my instructions for us as New Testament believers. God comes and gives us instructions. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. May I say something else here? That he is speaking from the point of the very presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant that it is when we are in the presence of God, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and we're right with Him, that, we, that we, we tend more to hear the speaking voice of God through His Word. Isn't that so? Back, if you would, to Leviticus for a moment. Now, I want you to notice... <clears throat> As we move from there on, notice verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, does everybody see this? What's the next three words? If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, not simply the elect, if any man. If any man bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. So he comes back, and we move to our, our, to our second major point here, approaching God with a burnt offering. So let's talk about these offerings here. You have several major offerings in the beginning of the book of Leviticus. Lord willing, we're going to look at them. And as we look at them, I believe it will help us view better the person and working of Christ and our response to Him. These first offerings are voluntary. People come and bring a voluntary offering. But I don't want you to miss this point. I think it's really, really important. If any man... I'm going to stop and just say that the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes our lives, is, I believe, is open to any man. Amen. For God so loved the world, the Bible tells us. So if you're here today, and I'm going to ask you, has there been a time in your life, you can go to your mind right now, you can go to in your mind right now and say, I know that I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Can you go to that time in your mind? Uh, if you can't do that, and you go and you say, well, Mama told me I did that, that's not sufficient. If you go in your mind to an experience, that's not sufficient. By the way, if you go in your mind and say, well, I believe in God, that is not sufficient. You need to be able to go to a time when there's a transaction that's taken place, like we're going to see upcoming in these verses. A time when you recognized yourself as a sinner, you gave God your sin, and He in the person of Christ gave you His righteousness. Not because we're anything, but because He's everything. So if any man, don't, if you can't be here today and say to me, I'm too sinful, if you only understood what I did. Read the life of the Apostle Paul. Okay? He murdered other believers before he was saved. Okay, if you're here and you said, well, I just can't believe faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. All right, though, though, those truths are there. The fact is, I I just can't be saved is not true. It's not true. If any man, the Bible addresses us here. And we have a description, if you would, of this first offering, and we're just going to touch on it. It is called a burnt offering, okay? Forget all the jokes, you know, about you coming home, just getting married, and your wife offers up a burnt offering. Just, just, just forget that. This burnt offering right here is the biggest offering of the Old Testament. It was actually an offering that could have been offered every day. It wasn't, but it could have been. You're actually going to find in symbolism this offering the whole way back in Genesis chapter 4. You're going to find it running through the patriarchs. It was a general 
offering up to God to appease God. It was an offering of recognition to God. But when we come right here, the burnt offering is a volunteer offering where someone is coming wanting to be right with God. We'll see in this burnt offering uh, several things. It's a great picture of the substitutionary sacrifice. Substitutionary. There was a substitute. Like Jesus Christ was our substitute. He went to Calvary and died so you don't have to face God's punishment. The burnt offering is a substitutory, substitutory sacrifice. Um, it is an offering of surrender, and we're going to see that. If you put the word substitution, surrender, and sinner, those three S's, you're going to understand this offering. It's an offering of substitution. It's an offering, picting, complete and total surrender. And it's an offering where the sinner comes desiring to be right with God. If you are not right with God and your sins stand between you and God, you can be right with God. That stands here. If I go, and let, let's just take time, um, because I really want us to get this, go back to Genesis 4, and we'll come back here to Leviticus. Genesis 4. All right, Genesis 4. In Genesis 4, Adam and Eve have fallen into sin. God has dealt with them. He has now taken them out of the garden, and they're starting their life. As Adam and Eve start their life, they have children. As they have children, guess what Adam did? Adam instructed his children how to be right with God. Moms and dads, what's your responsibility? To help keep your children, your teenagers, your influence. What? How to be right with God. Now notice this. It's very important. Okay? Um, it says in verse 2, And she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the what? Sheep. Sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So you have a farmer here. You, you both of them farmer, uh, farming as it were in a type. One of them is dealing with sheep. One of them is dealing with garden and vegetables. Can I put it that way? And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now I want to tell you what. Can you imagine what the fruit of the ground would have been like back there? Did you ever see these pictures of like these 300 pound pumpkins? You know what I mean? I can't imagine, but uh, back in Genesis here, I can only imagine that what he brought would have taken our breath away. It would have been outstanding. He brings that as an offering to the Lord. But we're going to find as we read, he brings the fruit of the ground as an offering to the Lord to go ahead and have his sins dealt with. And God rejects it. Notice if you would, verse number four. So we're saying, here now comes the burnt offering. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. That means he offered the whole animal up. It was killed and offered up. And the Lord had respect unto Abel in those offering. How did he have respect? The fire of God fell and I believe burned the offering up. Now notice, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. What do we have happening here? We have, we have the first bloodless sacrifice, wanting to appease God with sin. You cannot deal with sin without the offering of blood and sacrifice. All those Old Testament offerings look forward to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, that would come and die for us. Cain is the first liberal theologian. We have them all through Frederick County here. That believes God can be appeased if you put somebody in a baptistry or if you speak with tongues. 
or if you just do good works. Now, may I ask you, what is your salvation based on? Say, Pastor, I'm always struggling with my relationship with God. Well, let me ask you, have you established a relationship with Jesus? You see, you can know all about God. You can know about the Bible. You can believe in God. You can believe Jesus. You can believe all of those things. But if you've never done business with him, that's what has to happen. Here is the first burnt offering if you would. Um, I'm, for time's sake, I'm not going to turn, but I will read to you in Genesis 8. After the flood, Noah comes out, and what's the first thing he does? He offers up a burnt offering as a thank you to God for what he has accomplished. Now, I have the whole, the whole second section of this message that is just filled with our responses to God, and it's really good. And I'm going to save it for tonight. Amen. All right? So please come back tonight. All right? You, you wouldn't cut um, a train and its cars in half. Okay? So come back tonight. Again, I said this would be a message of introduction, and I hope it's been helpful with your view of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's, let's go ahead and pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your watch care.